Welcome back to our lectures on language theory. This is lecture number 10 within the course language theory and the last lecture within their module theoretical grammar. These lectures are delivered specially for students of the departments of English and German languages whose major is foreign language to foreign languages. The theme of this lecture is the phrase, the sentence, classification of sentences. The content of this lecture will include the following points. First of all, we'll speak about the subject matter of syntax. Then we'll talk about the definition of the phrase. Then we'll consider structural types of phrase. After that, We'll discuss the definition and characteristic features of the sentence. One will have a brief review of the division of the sentence and will finish with the classification of sentences. The grammatical structure of language comprises two major parts, morphology and syntax. The two areas are obviously interdependent and together they constitute the study of grammar. Morphology deals with paradigmatic and syntagmatic properties of morphological units, morphemes and words. It is concerned with the internal structure of words and their relationship to other words and word forms within the paradigm. It studies morphological categories and their realization. Syntax, on the other hand, deals with the way words are combined. It is concerned with the external functions of words and their relationship to other words within the linearly ordered units, word groups, sentences, and texts. Syntax studies the way in which the units and their meanings are combined. It also deals with peculiarities of syntactic units, their behavior in different contexts. The syntactic language level can be described with the help of special linguistic terms and notions. Syntactic unit, syntactic form, syntactic meaning, syntactic function, syntactic position, and syntactic relations. Syntactic unit is always a combination that has at least two constituents. The basic syntactic units are a word group, a clause, a sentence, and a text. Syntactic meaning is the way in which separate word meanings are combined to produce meaningful word groups and sentences. For example, green ideas sleep furiously. This sentence is quite correct grammatically. However, it makes no sense as it lacks syntactic meaning. Syntactic form may be described as the distributional formula of the unit pattern. For instance, John hates the ball. The syntactic form is noun plus verb plus noun. Syntactic function is the function of a unit on the basis of which it is included to a larger unit. In the word group, a smart student, the word smart, is in subordinate attributive relations to the head element, that is, the word student. In traditional terms, it is used to denote syntactic function of a unit within the sentence like subject, predicate, attribute, etc. Syntactic position is the position of an element. The order of constituents in syntactic units is of principal importance in analytical languages. The syntactic position of an element may determine its relationship with the other elements of the same unit. For instance, his broad back. In this case, back is a noun, a back district, to go back to back somebody. Syntactic relations are syntagmatic relations observed between syntactic units. They can be of three types, coordination, subordination, and predication. The next point of our lecture is the definition of the phrase. The main object of study in syntax is the communicative unit of the language, the sentence. The phrase is the syntactic unit used as a notional part of a sentence. 
As a level forming unit, it is characterized by some common and some differential features with the unit of a lower level, the word, and the unit of the upper level, the sentence. Like the word, the phrase is a nominative unit, but it provides a complex nomination of the referent. A polynomination consisting of several, at least two, nominative components, presenting the referent as a complicated phenomenon. A girl, a beautiful girl. A decision, his unexpected decision. Moreover, the regular free phrase does not enter speech as a ready-made unit like the word. It is freely formed in speech, like the sentence, according to a certain grammatical pattern. As for the fixed word combinations, idioms, they are closer to the word in the type of nomination. They are ready-made units, fixed in dictionaries and studied mainly by lexicology. The definition of the phrase is rather a controversial issue. In Russian linguistics, the narrow approach which was put forward by Vinogradov traditionally prevails. Only a combination of two notional words, one of which dominates the other, is considered a word combination. A much broader approach was proposed by Leonard Bloomfield, and it is shared by many modern linguists. One of the leading specialists in this field, Burlakova, defines a word combination as any syntactically organized group of syntagmatically connected words. This includes combinations of functional and notional words, and predicative and coordinative combinations of words. Critical revision of these two approaches is possible on the basis of the above-given description of the phrase as a separate lingual unit. Defining the phrase as a polynominative lingual unit helps reveal the status of notional phrases, semantically independent or autosemantic combinations of notional words as the basic type of phrasemes. Besides notional phrases, Two other structural types of syntagmatic groupings of words can be distinguished, which can be defined as phrases or word combinations only in form, formative phrases and functional phrases. The formative phrase is a combination of a notional word with a functional word, which is contextually dependent and functionally similar to separate notional words used in various grammatical forms. For example, of Peter, which means Peter's, or in a moment, without doubt. Functional phrases are combinations of functional words similar to regular functional words. For instance, apart from, as soon as, with reference to, must be able, Besides the classification of word groupings on the basis of the major syntagmatic connections outlined above, there are further subdivisions and generalizations and other approaches possible in the description of the phrase. The traditional classification of phrases is based on the part of speech characteristics of their constituents. There are noun phrases, for instance, a beautiful girl, men, women, and children, verbal phrases like went home, came and went, adjective phrases, for instance, quite unexpected, nice and quiet, adverbal phrases, for example, quite unexpectedly. On the base of kernel adjunct relations, subordinative Phrases can be divided into those with objective connections, direct objective and indirect objective, and qualifying connections, attributive and adverbal. For example, to see a child, this is direct objective phrase. Put on the table, indirect objective phrase. A beautiful girl, attributive, and came soon, 
adverbal. On the base of the position of the adjunct in relation to the kernel, subordinative phrases are characterized as regressive or progressive. In regressive phrases, the adjunct precedes the kernel. For example, a nice girl. In this phrase, girl is the kernel, that is the nucleus of the phrase. And nice is the adjunct, that is the complement, additional element uh, to the nucleus. In progressive phrases, the adjunct follows the kernel. For example, came home. Came is the kernel in this phrase, and home is the adjunct. Now we will consider the definition and characteristic features of the next element of syntactic level, that is, sentence. The sentence is the central object of study in syntax. It can be defined as the immediate integral unit of speech built up by words according to a definite syntactic pattern and distinguished by a contextually relevant communicative purpose. The correlation of the word and the sentence shows some important differences and similarities between these two main level-forming lingual units. Both of them are nominative units, but the word just names objects and phenomena of reality. It is a purely nominative component of the word stock, while the sentence is at the same time a nominative and predicative lingual unit. It names dynamic situations or situational events and at the same time reflects the connection between the nominal denotation of the event on the one hand and objective reality on the other hand showing the time of the event, its being real or unreal, desirable or undesirable, etc. A sentence can consist of only one word, as any lingual unit of the upper level can consist of only one unit of the lower level. For example, why? Thanks. But a word making up a sentence is thereby turned into an utterance unit expressing various connections between the situation described and actual reality. So, the definition of the sentence as a predicative lingual unit gives prominence to the basic differential feature of the sentence as a separate lingual unit. That is, it performs the nominative function like the word or the phrase, and at the same time it performs the reality evaluating or predicative function. Being a unit of speech, the sentence is distinguished by a relevant intonation. Each sentence possesses certain intonation contours, including pauses, pitch movements, and stresses, which separate one sentence from another in the flow of speech, and, together with various syntagmatic means of expression, participate in rendering essential communicative predicative meanings, for example, interrogation. The definition of the category of predication is similar to the definition of the category of modality, which also shows a connection between the named objects and actual reality. However, modality is a broader category revealed not only in grammar but in the lexical elements of language. For example, various modal meanings are expressed by modal verbs, by word particles of specifying modal semantics, by semi-functional modal words and phrases of subjective evaluation like perhaps, unfortunately, by all means, and by other lexical units. Predication can be defined as syntactic modality expressed by the sentence. 
The center of predication in the sentence is the finite form of the verb, the predicate. It is through the finite verb's categorical forms of tense, mood, and voice that the main predicative meanings, actual evaluations of the event, are expressed. Tessner, who introduced the term valency in linguistics, described the verbal predicate as the core around which the whole sentence structure is organized according to the valences of, pre- of the predicate verb. He subdivided all verbal complements and supplement- supplements into so-called actants, elements that identify the participants in the process, and circumstance, or elements that identify the circumstances of the process. Besides the predicate, other elements of the sentence also help express predication. For example, word order, various functional words, and, in oral speech, intonation. In addition to verbal time and mood evaluation, the predicative meanings of the sentence include the purpose of communication, affirmation and negation, and other meanings. Predication is the basic differential feature of the sentence, but not the only one. There is a profound difference between the nominative function of the word and the nominative function of the sentence. The nominative content of a syntagmatically complete average sentence, called a preposition, reflects a processual situation, an event that includes a certain process as its dynamic center, the agent of the process, the objects of the process, and various conditions and circumstances of the realization of the process. The situation, together with its various elements, is reflected through the nominative parts of the sentence, distinguished in the traditional grammatical or syntactic division of the sentence, which can also be defined as its nominative division. No separate word, no matter how many stems it consists of, can express the situation, nominative semantics of a proposition. Now we'll discuss the division of the sentence. The division of the sentence into its notional parts, subjects, objects, attributes, predicated, verbal modifiers, is called grammatical or syntactical division. This is a traditional analysis of the sentence. One more term is nominative division. In modern linguistics, uh, in theoretical grammar in particular, there exists one more kind of division of the sentence into its parts, actual division. It is based on the idea of evaluation of the actual importance of the information carried by different parts of the sentence. The main components of the actual division of a sentence are the theme and the rhythm. The theme is the starting point of communication, a thing or a phenomenon about which something is reported in the sentence. It usually contains some old, already known information. The rhythm is the basic informative part of the sentence. It's contextually relevant communicative center, the peak of communication, or the information reported about the theme. It usually contains some newer information. There may be transitional parts of actual division, neither purely thematic nor rhematic. They can be treated as a secondary rhyme, the sub-rhematic part of a sentence. And this part is called a transition. For example, again, Charlie is late. Again is considered to be transition. Charlie, theme, is late, ream. The ream is the obligatory informative component of a sentence. There may be sentences which include only the ream. The theme and the transition are optional. And now we'll talk about classification of sentences. 
The sentence is a communicative unit. Therefore, the primary classification of sentences must be based on the communicative principle. According to the purpose of communication, three types have been recognized in traditional grammar. The declarative sentence expresses a statement, either affirmative or negative, and stands in correlation with the listener's responding signals of attention, feeling, etc. The imperative sentence expresses inducement, either affirmative or negative. It urges the listener in the form of request or command to perform or not to perform a certain action. The interrogative sentence expresses a question, that is, a request for information wanted by the speaker from the listener. Traditionally, the so-called exclamatory sentence is distinguished as one more communicative type of sentence. Exclamatory sentences are marked by specific intonation patterns, word order, and special constructions with functional auxiliary words, rendering the high emotional intensity of the utterance. For example, do come in. But these regular grammatical features cannot be sufficient for placing the exclamatory sentence on the same level as the three cardinal communicative types of sentences. According to the number of uh, and there is one more classification, that is the structural classification of sentences. According to the number of predicative lines, sentences are classified into simple, composite, and semi-composite. The simple sentence is built up by one predicative line, while the composite sentence is built up by two or more predicative lines. As a polypredicative construction, the composite sentence reflects a few elementary situations as a unity. The dominating type of a simple sentence with full predication, containing both the subject and the predicate, is called a two-member sentence. One-member sentences contain either the subject or the predicate, which can be restored. Elliptical sentences are characteristic for colloquial speech, where some members of the sentence are omitted. A simple sentence containing some words besides the predication are extended. An unextended sentence has only the subject and the predicate. The compound sentence is based on coordination. By coordination, uh, the clauses in the composite sentence are arranged as units of syntactically equal rank. The position of the coordinate clause is always rigidly fixed, and it serves as one of the differential features of coordination as such. The complex sentence is based on subordination. By subordination, the principal clause positionally dominates the subordinate clause making up with it a semantic syntactic unity. The subordinate clause can be joined to the principal clause either by a subordinating connector, uh, syndetically, or with some types of clauses, asyndetically. Subordinate clauses can be classified on different principles, either functional or categorial. In accord with the functional principle, subordinate clauses are classified on the analogy of the positional parts of the simple sentence into subject, predicative, object, attributive, and adverbal. The categorical classification is aimed at revealing the inherent nominative properties of the subordinate clauses irrespective of their immediate position in the sentence. According to their integral features, all subordinate clauses are divided into four generalized types. Clauses of primary nominal positions, clauses of secondary nominal positions, clauses of adverbal positions, and clauses of parenthetical positions. Semi-composite sentences are sentences which describe more than one event of objective reality but contain primary and secondary predications. 
For example, we saw them crossing the street. We saw primary predication, them crossing secondary. Semi-composite sentences are divided into semi-complex and semi-compound according to the type of relations between the semi-clause and the main clause, subordinative and coordinative, respectively. This is all in brief concerning the content of this lecture. As a rule, you are offered a set of comprehension questions. And as usual, you are suggested a list of sources for further reading. Thank you for attention.